Zahir, are you online? Uh, yeah, let's just buy. How are you? Yeah, leave that. So we are ready whenever you are. Kamri Sahib, does Zahir have a presentation? Good, thank you. Ji, Bismillah, whenever you're ready. Everyone knows Zahir Lalani from London. He's been with us, with us many, many times. So welcome, Zahir, and thank you again for your time. Thank you very much, Aziz Bhai. Thank you for inviting me again. Um, let me just set up. <clears throat> can everybody see the presentation? This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I'm just going to move this out of the way. <clears throat> uh, Aziz Bai, can you see the presentation okay? Yes, I can. Okay, okay wonderful. Um, Yali with everybody, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm just going to keep an eye on the time. <clears throat> um, so today um, I thought of um, actually going through one of these other fundamental elements of of um, Islam, which I think um, it is is from from my understanding is really important, um, and it's something that I think is probably not that well discussed. Um, you know, we discuss a lot of topics, but the whole concept of duality specifically, and its link to the cyclical nature of religion, cyclical nature being everything is happening in in cycles um that's something that i think is <clears throat> possibly not as well discussed as some of the other topics so let's just go back to some uh, basic things that i think most people um w will have as an understanding maybe not people on on groups like this where obviously there are you know people who are very interested and people who are very well read but I think if we look at the general Jamaat, if we look at um, outside the Jamaat, we tend to find a very simplistic view of religion. And this is not only in Islam, it's through every religion. And I, I normally summarize that in a very simple way, that we begin with the fact that God creates the universe. We all live a life and we have to choose between right and wrong. And at the end of that process, we have a reward of either heaven or hell. And that basic principle of um, life is actually a very common way that people understand. But I think, look, that, you know, we have a lot of information now around what is in the Quran. We have a lot of new resources that have come out through IIS, through other means um, that have given us insights into what our peers and diets have written. And, and there is an amazing amount of information around topics that are really very deep in terms of the esoteric aspect. And, and this concept of duality and, and cycles it is quite a difficult topic when we get into it very deeply. But what I'm planning to do, um, I think, uh, as is by, we have two sessions. So the session today is really setting the, the ground the ground rules around these concepts. It's actually looking at why these concepts are important. It's looking at it from a nature perspective and it's looking at it from a Quranic perspective. And then we'll look at some of the indications around that. And then the following session, we will take those concepts and then we'll dig much deeper into how that impacts the reality of our religion, not Islam in general, but Islam from an Ismaili perspective. What is the deep Ismaili understanding of how religion works based on these principles? So first of all, what are the clues that we have in the Quran around this whole concept of, of duality and, and cycles? <clears throat> um, our peers and dyers have written about this. It's in poetry, it's in prose. Um, I'm sure I don't, I'm not very well versed in Ginans, but I'm, I know that there are things like this in the Ginans. So first of all, we look at 2133. 
and he it is who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon. They float, each in an orbit. So straight away, in that verse, we have the concept of two things, and the concept of things moving in circles. 3640. It is not for the sun to overtake the moon, nor doth the night outstrip the day. They float in an orbit. So what's that actually saying? We all understand that it floats in an orbit. But what that verse is actually hinting at, and in using the example of the sun and the moon, that one is not, doesn't have priority over the other. The night doesn't have priority over the day. And we'll come to that when we look at some other examples. We then have 3636. Glory be to him who created pairs of all things, of what the earth grows and of their kind and of what they do not know. So here there is a clear indication of everything happening in twos. That is the duality. But why? What is the indication around these things that there is something important around these two concepts? So these two concepts are actually quite key, not just in us understanding religion. <clears throat> these concepts emanate for some basic principles. And those basic principles relate to more than just religion. We have the concept of eternity, a circle, goes on and on and on. We have the concept of manifestation, which um, if you were in some of my previous lectures, I've mentioned several times. Manifestation being things that come out of something else. And ultimately, these concepts actually relate back to what we've spoken about before, and that is monoreality. That whole thing of monoreality is what drives all of the key concepts that we talk about. So let's first look at the relationship of these two things with the laws of God. The laws of nature, what we see around us, are all part of the laws of God. Everything we see, everything we touch, all the science that we do, we consider those our laws or the laws of nature. From our perspective, who made it? God. The laws of God encompasses the laws of nature. So God's laws, as far as Islam is concerned, encompasses everything spiritual and everything physical. And they are the same principles. And that's the key. If we find certain principles in the physical world, <clears throat> those same principles should indicate something about the spiritual world. And it is actually indicated in the Quran in 41.53. We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. And our peers have explained this particular verse by saying that the signs in the horizons refers to the signs that we're going to see in the world around us, science. And the signs within themselves is what we'll understand about our spirituality. It is about the inner self. So God himself says he will show us the signs outside and inside, and these will be signs that will connect to each other. So, of course, we need to look at science and nature. We need to understand the world around us. And one very basic way of doing that is <clears throat> beginning with something that we're all familiar with. It is one of the most fundamental things that most of us, not all of us, most of us experience. And that is the concept of a day and night. Day and night is so fundamental to how we live but it is also fundamental to the animal world. It is how they define their clock. They don't have an, um, you know, phones and watches. They rely on the day and night to give them an understanding of what part of the day they're in. 
But we all understand how day and night works. We all understand that there is a day and then comes the night. But how is day and night made? What makes day and night? Well, if we go into our science, we go into what we all learn within schools, day and night is made up from the rotation of the earth. It is the earth rotating and the sun's direction only being in one side that makes day and night. <clears throat> so here we have our first link of something that is a duality, two things, day and night, and something that is rotation, and the fact that one relates to the other. And that is what I'm going to continue to refer to as cyclical motion. But again, if we look at this whole concept that's in the Quran about the rotation of the, the earth, the rotation of the moon and the sun, we have to then ask ourselves, which one comes first, night or day? And the answer is what we read in the Quran. Neither outstrips the other. That is what that verse was saying. There is no uh, precedence of whether night comes first or day comes first. It depends upon where you are on the earth and what point you start your clock. Let's look at another example, <clears throat> and that is the cycle of blood. Again, something we're all familiar with, but maybe we're not familiar with the mechanics of how it works. So this is the cyclical process of blood flowing through our bodies. And it's that flow of blood that is critical to our lives. It is not just the means to provide life, it is also the means to remove the negative things, in, in, in particular carbon dioxide. So we live on oxygen and the bloodstream takes away carbon dioxide, which otherwise would kill us. And the important thing here is it's an eternal flow. That blood circulates all the time. If it didn't circulate all the time, we wouldn't get fresh oxygen and we wouldn't be removing all the bad um, CO2 all the time. It is a cyclical process. And the point about cyclical processes, it goes on and on and on. But how is it made? How does that cyclical process work? And for that, we need to look at the heart. The heart is actually what they refer to as a dual pump. It effectively has two sides that are pumping away. It is doing a push and a pull. So you've got these two things that are pumping away. One is pushing, one is pulling. And that's what makes that blood go in and out of the heart. So again, we can see that the concept of duality of two things, the two pushes and pulls, are actually leading to a cyclical motion. Another very common example, the tree and the seed, two things. Two things that look completely unrelated. Two things that nobody would dream of thinking are the same thing. But yet, that concept of the tree and the seed actually represents a lot of what happens in nature. You can replace seed with the word egg, and you will find other examples of an egg growing into a full-blown blown creature. And again, the concept of the tree is something that's used in the Quran quite a lot. And one particular example is in 1424. And we'll come to that again <clears throat> a bit later. But in this case, the duality is the tree and the seed. And the, the seed growing into the tree and the tree making fruit, which then gives us back a seed, gives us a cycle. So this time, we now have a cycle between the tree and the seed. But again, we ask the same question, which comes first, the tree or the seed? And there really is no answer because if you have a tree, a tree can make fruit and give you the seed. 
But if you have a seed, a seed can make a tree which can then give a fruit again. Another example is that of butterflies. And this is a very well known example, and there are many others, of two life forms that rotate in a circle. In this particular case, it is the caterpillar and the butterfly. And this this particular example encompasses, again, the two things of duality, the butterfly and the caterpillar, and the fact that they move in an ever-going ever circle. It's an eternal circle of these two life forms going between each other. But again, which one comes first, the caterpillar or the butterfly? And if we extend that example, we're extending into what is generally known as metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is actually a cycle of transformation. It is one creature transforming into another creature, which then transforms back into that same first creature. But there's one very additional um, important element around this concept of metamorphosis and the cycle that we have here. It is again, two things that are rotating between each other. So we have the duality and we have the cycle. <clears throat> but now we're introducing one other element, which is the metamorphosis. And the metamorphosis is in, in the sense that if we look at the tadpole or the caterpillar, they're actually of a limited capacity. But if you look at the butterfly and the frog, they are of greater capacity. And the same applies to the seed and the tree. The seed is a limited capacity. The tree is of a greater capacity. So that cycle, that cycle that's generated by the duality is also about a limited capacity thing transforming into a greater capacity thing. But there are many other forms of cycles. We have looked at some things there. Um, a lot of people will look at something that is actually a circle, but even what we've looked at so far are not circles. They are cycles. But within general science, and, and many people may be very familiar with this. There are also other forms of cycles, and one very famous one is obviously what Einstein came up with, and that is the whole concept of the very famous equation of E equals mc squared. What does that mean? All it means is there is a transformation between energy and mass, between energy and the physical things that we see. But it's not a one-way street. So we have two things. We have energy and we have mass. And there is a constant rotation between those two things. Energy is becoming mass. Mass is becoming energy. And if you look at the diagram, this is pure science. You have on the left-hand side, energy becoming mass. And on the right-hand side, the mass going back into energy. It is a scientific principle. But this particular um, example obviously is about the dual nature and cyclical nature at a microscopic level. But it is an eternal flow in the same principle as we've been through so far of a transformation between two things. It's a transformation of mass to energy and energy back to mass. But as I've said, a cycle is not always a circle. Some things that we don't consider to be cyclical actually are. And if you look at the diagram that's on the screen, that's actually a picture on what's known as an oscilloscope. It allows you to see the movement of energy. And these are what we commonly call waves, not the seaside waves. They're similar, but these are waves of, of energy. They're waves of electricity. They're waves of light. But waves are also cyclical. Why? Because they repeat. There is a repeating pattern in a wave. It is going up and down, up and down, up and down. 
and mathematically that is cyclical. And if we think about the concept of light, light would not exist without the concept of waves. And there are some complicated things around explaining light, but let's keep it simple. In one particular aspect, light is a wave. Music, something we're all familiar with. How does music work? How do we hear? We would not have music if we didn't have a cyclical motion of waves. But then how is that made? How do we hear the wonderful music that comes out of all these instruments? And the answer is, remember the heart where we had the dual pump. It was a push and a pull. Well, music relies on the same principle. It relies on a push and pull. If you remember, if you see how a speaker works, if you've ever had access, and unfortunately these days our children seem to only understand music out of a phone, but if you go to a proper um, traditional speaker and you open up the grill and you look at the speaker cone, you will see the speaker moving back and forth. If you play some really loud music, every time the bass goes thump, that speaker cone will go in and out, in and out, in and out, very visibly. And it is the push and pull motion of that speaker that's actually pushing the air and producing waves. So this simple push and pull motion is actually generating waves of air. And it is the waves of air that hit your eardrum and they vibrate your eardrum. Your eardrum is going back and forth, back and forth. And that's generating signals in your head that turns it into music. And we have the same concept in terms of negative and positive. We all have electricity. We all understand electricity. But electricity is also made from a push and pull. It is made from a push and pull of negative and positive. A battery has a negative and a positive. If you look at the electricity we get out of our walls, it is what's called alternating current. It is a push and pull that gives you this. One more example I want to look at, <clears throat> and that is something that we call centripetal force. <clears throat> Ignore the fancy words. All of us must have done this. We have a string, we put a ball on the end of the string, and we do that. And the ball goes around the string. It never flies away. It stays exactly where we want it at the end of the string. And the science behind that is what this word is, centripetal force. What does that mean? It is again an example of a push and pull that's related to a cyclical motion. Why does the ball go round and round? It goes round and round because the ball has actually got two opposing forces. There is a force that's making the ball go straight and there is a force that's pulling the ball back because of the string. It is a push and pull force and that is generating a cyclical motion. So what are the consequences of all these things that we've looked at? We've talked about science, we've talked about nature, we've looked at how this duality and cyclical connection works. Well, we, we've only been through a few examples, but these, these things actually exist all throughout science and nature. The more we look, the more we find this whole concept of duality and cycles exists everywhere. And one of the important things around cyclical nature is that it is actually a form of eternity. If you draw a circle, once a circle is complete, there is no start or end point. You cannot tell where the person began drawing the circle. It is just a continuous thing that you can go round and round and round. And the other thing that we've learned through the examples we've seen is that duality, the form of two things, is actually a means of enabling cycles. 
And the other important thing about the duality is that duality coexists. What do I mean? What I mean is, if we look at examples around us, yes, we have day and night, but that doesn't mean that the entire earth is in day or night. We know that. We know when it is day in the US, it is night in the UK. It can coexist. Take hot and cold. We know that we have things that are hot and things that are cold. We have hot water and cold water, but we can have them both at the same time, as long as they are in different places. We have positive and negative. They coexist. And the example I gave of the light, when I said it wasn't as simple as, as just saying a wave, well, light is an example of something that actually exhibits two different ways of working. It is both working as a particle under certain circumstances or as a wave under certain circumstances. And the important conclusion around all of this, and this is the thing that we now need to start noting in our minds. <clears throat> Remember that verse where God says, we will show you our signs in the horizons. We will show you our signs in the earth and the universe in which you live because those are the ones that are going to enable us to understand the signs within. So if we look at this concept of duality and cyclical motion, one of the fundamental concepts we need to take out of this is that this constant motion is what we call life. Life is not something that stands still. Life has to be about movement. Life has to be about things that are constantly changing. And the change, the constant movement that we have, fundamentally comes out of these two things that we've spoken about. It comes out of the duality and the cyclical motion. So keep that in mind, because that's an important principle that we then need to revisit later on. So we've been through all the science and the nature. We now need to start looking at what is the Quranic perspective around these principles. Remember, we said the laws of God are all encompassing. Whatever laws we find in science and nature should be the same laws that we find in spirituality. So let's go back to those three things that we looked at at the very start. <clears throat> 2133. And he it is who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon. They float, each in an orbit. This is the principle of cycles. Everything has a cyclical motion. 3640. It is not for the sun to overtake the moon, nor doth the night outstrip the day. They float, each in an orbit. This is the principle of what is termed non-posteriority and non-anteriority, i.e. this one doesn't take precedence over this one. They both have the same priority. One does not come before the other. And this particular principle is something that is really important, I think, for us to begin to take on board because it is one of the ones without which a lot of questions remain unanswered. 3636, glory be to him who created pairs of all things, of what the earth grows and of their kind and of what they do not know. This is the principle of duality, everything created in pairs. So one of the most fundamental cycles that we have is what we know as the cycle of return. In 2156, it says, to Allah we belong and to him is our return. For all of us, that is the most important cycle that we will have to follow. But if we follow the same principle that we've been through now, this is a cycle of return. 
But what is the duality we need in order for that cycle to work? The duality we need is that there is this world and there is that world, because without this world and that world, there would be no concept of a return and a cycle. Our movement through these two is the cycle of return. But one important thing to keep in mind, wherever we've spoken about duality and cycles, it is an eternal motion. And one of the things that most people get, get caught up on is that they consider this to be a single movement of the circle. And yet the principle that has been shown to us in science and nature in the horizons is an eternal cycle but that is driven by this duality. What about God's being? 57.3, he is the first, he is the last, he is the manifest and he is the hidden or the unseen and he knows all things. This verse actually is so, um, when I started looking into this and, and trying to research on this, this verse has so much within it that I think um, it, it could fill out a, a whole paper of, of examples. But if you look at the whole concept around this, he is the first and the last. If you think about a circle, where is the starting point and where is the ending point? There isn't. This is an indication of a complete circle with no starting and no ending. He is the manifest and he is the hidden. Look at the concept of that duality of E equals MC squared, the energy mass thing. Energy becoming mass, mass becoming energy. Hidden becoming manifest, manifest going back to hidden. But it is an endless cycle of something going between these two states. So there is also there the concept of duality, that he exists as Zahir, but he also exists in Bhati. By first and last, he exists in pre-eternity and he exists in post-eternity. Ultimately, and we always keep coming back to this with these concepts, this verse is actually about monoreality because monoreality gives you all those elements in one concept. In monoreality, you have the hidden. In monoreality, you have the timeless. In the manifest that comes from the monoreality, you have the manifest. And you also see the movement of that circle within the manifestation. Let's look at another concept that's well known in the Quran, and that is the four rivers, 4715. Therein are rivers of water that does not alter, and rivers of milk, the taste whereof does not change, and rivers of drink delicious to those who drink, and rivers of honey clarified. And for them, therein are all fruits and protection from their Lord. Now, of course, most people look at these rivers as being the rivers of paradise, the nice, beautiful place that we'll all go to. But the writings of our peers and eyes has actually put a lot of esoteric meaning behind this verse. And there are multiple meanings. It is not just one meaning. But one of the things that has been taken out of this is two pairs, two sets of rivers each. You have the concept of aklikul and nafsikul the universal intellect and the universal soul. And then you have the other pair, which is the Natik, or generally prophethood, and the Asas, or generally Imamat. So you've got two pairs of things. But these two pairs are the fundamental roots of religion. But the important concept over here is why do we need this concept of both aklikul and nafsikul? 
why do we need both the concept of Nartic and the SAS? And there is a fundamental philosophical reason that some of our peers have talked about extensively. And whether you go to the books of uh, Tusi, you go to the books of Pir Nasikusro, you will find these concepts repeated in a lot of detail. And that is that unity, unity has to go through duality first. From the one has to come the two. And only from the two can you get what is called multiplicity, everything we see around us. It has been created as a fundamental principle within Quranic philosophy. That is why we find that in terms of the Godhead, in terms of unity, the first thing that happens is it expresses itself as duality. So we have universal intellect and universal soul. We have both Natik and Asas. Something else I've mentioned previously is one of the most important hadiths for Shias, and that is the Hadith of Sakhalain. This is about leaving behind two weighty things, the book and the, the progeny. Again, two elements required for religion. You have the written revelation, the book, and you have the speaking revelation, the imamat. And together they form a cycle of knowledge. Nowhere within Ismaili philosophy does it say just the Quran is enough or just the Imam is enough. The fundamental principle within Ismailism and Shia in general is that you have this duality of the book and the Imam. And together they form a cycle of knowledge. One confirms the other. By reading the Quran, by looking at the Quran, understanding the Quran, it corroborates the existence of Imamat. And by understanding the Imam, by understanding the position of the Imam, we get clarity about the content of the Quran. And the way they work together is again well documented. The Imam is Mubin, and the Quran is Bayan, what has been said. Another key concept within the Quran is <clears throat> what is referred to as Shajarai Daiba, and that is in 1424, a goodly saying as a goodly tree, its root set firm, its branch reaching into heaven giving its fruit at every season by permission of its Lord. But one word of warning, and, and I've said this on previous occasions, <clears throat> you will not find, I suspect, a single Quranic translation which gives the correct, um, the correct translation of this verse. You will find verses that talk about roots and branches, or one root and multiple branches or multiple roots and one branch. You will not find what is actually written in the Arabic, which is one root and one branch. And the fact that it is one root and one branch says something very specific, because there is no physical tree that we know of that only has a single root and a single branch. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind when you read uh, the English translations. And this tree that is in the Quran again has been written about extensively in, in our books. It is a tree which connects heaven and earth through its two ends. It is a tree with a root and a branch, one down, one up. And that tree is actually representative of the Imam of the time. Because it is the Imam of the time that gives fruit of knowledge, fruit of guidance in every season. And it is the Imam of the time who straddles the heaven and the earth, the root and the branch. 
And that same concept of this duality of the imamat, the imam straddling the earth and the heaven, is given in many other examples. And one such example is known as Majma'ul Bahrain, or the confluence of two oceans. Which two oceans? The Majma'ul Bahrain that's referred to is the oceans of this world and that world. Again, two oceans. But that concept is identical to the concept in 1424 of the goodly tree. The tree with a root and a branch. It is in this world and it is in that world. It is also the same example of the rope of God, Hablila, in 3103. It is that rope which we have to hold fast to, this ayat that Imam referred to in the Jubilees. It is that rope that extends between the heaven and the earth, one end on the earth, one end on the heaven, and it is that rope that will actually guide us on the right path. Two ends. And all of these things actually, from our perspective, refer to the Imam. Because on the one hand, the Imam is unity. He is the monoreality. He is that point of focus of everything where there is a unity of all of creation. But the Imam is also duality. The Imam lives in that world in his spirituality, but he lives in this world in his body. And the Imam is also multiplicity because the Imam's reach goes everywhere through all the things the Imam has, through his uh, peers and dais, hujats, through the institutions that he has. The Imam extends throughout the globe. And the important element of the imamat is that it is a continuous cycle. It is one imam after another, after another, after another. There is a continual cycle, and we'll come back to that in the next session. We then come back to this whole concept of creation from unity. <clears throat> and if we look at 4.1, be careful of your duty to your Lord who created you from a single soul, and from it created its mate, Zoja. The word used is Zoja, which actually means pair or wife. And from them, Twain hath spread abroad a multitude of men and women. And this verse is actually telling us something very critical based on all the principles we've looked at. Note here that God does not say that you were all created um, from a single soul all at the same time. It does talk about from unity was created duality. Created you from a single soul and created its mate. And it's from that that a multitude of men and women were created. So you have unity. Then you have duality, then you have multiplicity. That same principle that we looked at a few slides ago. How does that work? Unity is nafsi wa'idah, the universe, the, the single soul. We looked at those four rivers. The nafsi wa'idah emanates as aklikul and nafsikul. It emanates as nathik and asas. It emanates as imam and peer. And from those levels, from that level of duality, we then get the whole of creation. The whole of creation is dependent on that duality existing. And the examples in the Quran go on and on. And we can spend a lot of time on these, but I'm just going to go very quickly through these because these are just to give you an indication. There is the reference case or the
Sorry, can everybody hear me? I just had an internet connection problem. Yeah, we can hear you. So. Okay, fine. You then have Adam and Eve. Again, two things. You have good and evil. Again, two things, positive and negative. You have what is referred to as Dore Sattar and Dore Kash, or the, the period of, of um, concealment and the, the period of revelation. You have the concept in the story of Noah, that he took two of everything. Why two? Why did he just not take one of everything? Why did he not take five of everything? Why did the Quran say he took two of everything? You have the concept of the world of command and the world of creation, this world and that world, Alami Amr and Alami Kalk. And this is only a small list. There are even more examples about the whole, the concept of duality and the relation to cycles. <clears throat> so this leads us to a fundamental conclusion of uh, again, something we talked about in the monoreality lectures of this concept of looking at the whole versus looking at the part. And Pia Nasek Isra has actually put this really, really well. You do not see the whole, therefore you have gone astray. If you see the whole, your soul and body will have equal importance. Read that again. If you see the whole, your soul and body will have equal importance. And one of the uh, conclusions we have from there is that most of us tend to look at one aspect of this duality instead of the totality of that which is making us a circle. We either focus on this world or we focus on that world. We either focus on what is inside or what is outside. We do not see the whole, and therefore we do not give equal importance to two parts that make up the circle. So in summary, understanding duality and the link of duality to cyclical motion is a necessity. But understanding that duality, looking back to what Piranasu said, it is also a trial. Go back to Awal Akir Zahir Batin. Not everything is available to you. Some things are hidden, some things are visible. If we look at the concept of Natik and Asas, that duality is a trial for most Muslims. We think about most things that we have to deal with. The fact that something has a hidden meaning or an apparent meaning, something has a hidden aspect or an apparent aspect. These, this concept of good and evil, that duality is also a trial. So having gone through the importance of duality and cycles, having looked at how the Quran refers to it, having looked at some of the principles that that relates to, what we then want to do next time is actually take those principles and then actually deep dive into some of the fundamental um, philosophy of, of especially the Ismaili view on things, which is the whole principle around cycles and the cyclical nature of religion and how the principles that we've spoken about drives this whole philosophy that we have of things always being in cycles and what it means practically in our lives and our relationship to the Imam. And hopefully at the end of that session, I would hope that we would have a better understanding of the fact that the cyclical nature of religion is actually a reality that makes more sense. That without looking at this cyclical nature, we have lots of questions that are unanswered. But if we take duality, we take the cyclical nature and we look at how it has been explained as necessary to the whole process of religion, the process of creation, the process of our own selves, then 
hopefully some of those really, really complicated questions that we continue to ask ourselves begin to slowly fade away because it all makes more sense. So thank you for your time today and I'd be glad to answer questions if there are. Yali Madhu. Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Uh, Kamran Sahib, do we have any questions? Or can we open the mic so whoever has a question can go ahead and ask question directly? Yes, sir. I don't see any question in the chat room. Friends online, if you have any question, please go ahead and unmute yourself. I have a comment. Um, the here, thank you. So this is Gulnar. Thank you so very much for sharing this. Uh, I've not ever looked at it in this way, and uh, uh, very fascinating. And um, yes, I would love to read about it again. I'm hoping that you send this out. But even if you don't, I'm going to now look into this aspect of uh, the duality aspect and try and understand it better. But thank you so much. This was excellent. Great. Thank you very much, Gulnar. Hi, this is Shabnam Kimani. I was amazing. My God is so beautiful. Thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed this class today. It was perfect. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Shabnam. Thank you for your comments. Uh, this is Nasim Chunara, Yali Mother. Malani Mother, Nasim. Yes, this is something different, never heard before, really. It was something very new to understand. And we would like to have more of this type of session. So, Yali Madhar, and thank you so kind of you. Thank you very much. Malani Madhar, thank you. On that note, Zahir will be back next week at the same time, 4 o'clock Central Dallas time, 3 o'clock London time or I'm sorry, uh, 10 o'clock London time and uh, five o'clock Toronto time with a part two of this session. Please do join. And after this, inshallah, by tomorrow, we will share the recording of this session and inshallah, the slides of this session along with it. For those who wanted to follow up on the slides and questions and there was just so much material we need to cover it will give us about a few days to look at it so when he's back we can take fully advantage of his knowledge and the uh, the way he presents thank you everybody do we have any thank more you. questions so here i was just wondering uh, as he smiles are we living our daily life in three different phases or ways or i don't know i can't the end part i'm I'm not, I'm trying to figure out the end part of it on daily basis. Um, so the, yeah, the, the, I'm just trying quickly summarize. So the daily, the daily basis of this is really, I'm hoping we'll come together in the next session, but it's not about living in three different phases. It's actually about understanding not to live in three different phases or two phases. The whole principle behind all of this comes back down to us realizing that everything we have is interconnected. Um, our lives have um, a spiritual aspect and a physical aspect, but that those aspects are, are intertwined in a very complex way. There is, there is a harmony that exists that actually most of us don't realize. Um, you know, even that whole presentation that I sort of partway joined with the colors uh, the color of God. Um, there are so many elements in spirituality that are very, very complicated, very difficult for us to actually appreciate. But the answer to the question is in the Quran itself, is that if we look at the examples within science and nature, things that we have every day, those principles will enable to, to, uh, us to understand a bit better 
what the spiritual elements are, what the spiritual aspects are. And without sort of having a grasp of the fundamental laws of nature that exist, that we have access to daily, um, it becomes very hard for us to fully grasp our spiritual aspects. And one of the sort of clues I gave in that was, <clears throat> and it's, it's not something I can sort of fully go into right now, but that whole concept of the cycle of return, the concept that from him we come and to him will return. Most people, when they read that, think about, we have been created and we're gonna go back to God, end of story. But actually that breaks the fundamental law that has been put in place. And the fundamental law is yes, there is this duality of this world and that world. But the other fundamental reality is that it is a cyclical nature and cycles do not stop, cycles continue. So how do you correlate this cycle of return as one cycle versus the laws that have already been put in place, which are around the duality is easy, but the, the eternal cyclical nature of that return, how do we reconcile the two? So that that's the sort of point I was making is, is that we have to use these understandings of these fundamental principles to actually drive our understanding of, of our own being and our existence. I, I don't know whether that makes a little bit more sense. A, a little bit. Does that mean if we go through this process with you, um, then we will understand ourselves, what, what we are meant to do here as individuals or so I, look, I don't, I don't profess to, I don't profess to have all the answers. I can only um, explain to you, obviously, how I understand things. But I can absolutely tell you that before I was taught these kinds of principles, before I began reading more on these kinds of principles, my questions about who I am and what my life is about were not answered, and I, I was quite inquisitive in my younger days. And I would not find the right answers from most otherwises or most sessions that used to take place. And it was only once these principles were explained and these principles began to make sense in everything that I looked at, that actually then I began to understand my own self in a very different light. And actually those questions that used to really bug me slowly faded away because those questions didn't matter anymore because they didn't make sense around these principles. So I can absolutely tell you how it helped my journey and I'm hoping that it will hopefully help other people to see things in a different light. Whether it'll help or not help, we have to see. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Shanaz, go ahead with your question about the two rivers. I don't know if she's still with us. She was asking, how does the confluence of the two rivers or ocean actualize within our personal world? Uh, sorry, just by, can you just repeat that again? Yes. Okay, no, I found it. I found it here. How yes. does the confluence of two oceans actualize within our personal world? So, again, I mean, everything that we read in the Quran, one of the difficult parts is that um, there are multiple meanings around around everything. And that is one of the things that even Hazrat Ali has indicated, is that there are layers upon layers upon layers of meaning. Um, you know, Hazrat Ali has said, in, you know, in a beautiful um, uh, uh, saying that, you know, he could write enough books just on the word Bismillah that would require 70 camels worth of, of load. So th these concepts have different meanings depending on what level we look at them at. But the confluence of two oceans on one level is what I was indicating um, today was that the first and primary indication of a confluence of two oceans is actually the Imam himself. That the confluence of two oceans is that entity that straddles the two worlds of this world and that world. 
it is that entity that allows us to have a link between these two worlds because on our own we cannot see that world we cannot understand that world and it is the confluence it is that imamat that is actually the link between these two and is the form of guidance to allow us to have access to how to how to actualize that that other world so on the one hand and the primary understanding is the imam but yes on another understanding that confluence of two oceans is also about our own selves and it is what Pir Nasikisra was indicating that if we do not look at the whole if we do not understand the whole we will only look at one part of ourselves and mostly it will be the body but the person that sees the whole will give equal importance to body and soul note he did not say will give more importance to soul rather than body but will give equal importance why because one relates to the other they are part of a circle they are part of a cycle and not understanding our physical selves and the importance of our physical selves as part of the journey to our spiritual selves is the thing that actually makes it very hard for us to progress spiritually so the, that confluence is also about understanding that we are actually a hidden self which is our spirituality and a physical self which is our, our bodies and that confluence and finding the balance that whole thing that Imam says balancing din and dunya understanding where these two things link it is part of the the thing that you know we all need to strive towards subhanallah subhanallah do we have any more question please go ahead and unmute and ask if not we can stop here we like to thank zaid once again we truly appreciate and we know it's very late in london but still you have stayed up late and uh, presented a beautiful most beautiful presentation out of this world and inshallah and we're looking forward to your next session and the bathing of it thank you so much um, um, thank you thank you everybody in yali madad yali madad thank you everybody for joining us yali madad, yali madad. Yali madad.